Thanks for having me. Uh, I'm old school, no PowerPoint. I hate to waste this beautiful audiovisual facility. Uh, I also know a little bit too much about disasters. I live in New Orleans. I've served on the post-Katrina reform levy board. Uh, but today I'm obviously talking about pandemics. And the influenza virus is one of the fastest mutating viruses in existence. That's why you need a new vaccination every year, because it changes. But periodically, as far back as we can look in history, and very likely as far forward as we'll go in history, uh, a new virus will jump species. All influenza viruses originally started out in birds. When that new virus enters the human population and begins to pass between people, that's when you have a new pandemic. We have no way of knowing whether the next one will be exceedingly mild, such as in 2009, or whether it will be like 1918, or conceivably worse. Right now, there are two avian viruses that have, in the last 15 years, infected over 2,300 people, and their case mortality is 45%, uh, which is pretty scary. Now, the death toll, another way to scare you, in 1918, if you adjust for population, would be about the equivalent of 225 to 450 million people today. And modern medical care would certainly be able to cut that death toll, but it wouldn't come even close to cutting it uh, to zero or, or anything like that. For one thing, until you have an effective vaccine, which would take a minimum of six months, uh, you don't have any drugs that are, that are very effective against influenza. So anybody with viral pneumonia would uh, be exactly in the same situation as 1918. You have intensive care units, but those beds are extremely limited. Uh, in terms of secondary bacterial infections, which killed most of the people in 1918, even today, with ICUs, with the best of modern medical care, uh, the case mortality is about 8%. And if a pandemic strikes, with today's just-in-time economy, you're not going to have air traffic controllers, truckers, production workers. That just-in-time economy is going to break down. You're going to run out of antibiotics. You're going to run out of syringes. You're going to run out of hospital gowns, gloves, basically everything, as will, you know, I mean, in healthcare or the general economy. So medicine is going to go backwards in a large pandemic. It's also going to strike everybody pretty much at the same time. So you're not going to get help from the outside. Each community is going to be pretty much on its own. In a moderate pandemic in the United States, there would be somewhere between 60 and 100 million people sick enough to require medical care. So again, you can see how many ICU beds are going to be filled or are available. A tiny, tiny infinitesimal fraction. And how many nurses and doctors are going to be out sick to take care of them. Worldwide, it would be probably as much as 2 billion people. So it pretty much sets us back in some ways to where we were in 1918, which means you've got to look at that to extract every lesson you possibly can. And the first lesson is that we really need a universal vaccine, one that would work against all influenza viruses. Uh, Historically, this has not been a high priority for uh, funding. Uh, West Nile used to get more funding than vaccine research for influenza. The highest death, death toll annually for West Nile in the U.S. was 284 people. Influenza, seasonal influenza, kills between 3,000 and 56,000. But West Nile was getting more funding. So to the extent that you have any political juice, tell your representatives, put the money where it could do some good. Uh, 
So if we go back towards 1918, you do have some tools that you could use. And th there has been developed by uh, CDC and others, and I was part of the initial thinking on this, uh, what are called non-pharmaceutical interventions. What you do when you don't really have any drugs that are going to work, NPIs for short. And NPIs and risk communication are very closely linked. You cannot get public compliance with NPIs, much less sustain public compliance because these things last for weeks when it's in a community, not, not a couple of days, unless you have outstanding risk communication. Uh, I, I tend to dislike the phrase risk communication because I think it implies managing the truth. And you don't manage the truth, you tell the truth. Now, I understand that it's impossible to tell the public everything. There's just too much information. But when you decide what message you are putting out, you have to approach it from the perspective that you're giving them the maximum. You're not trying to outsmart them. You're not trying to condescend to them. When you do that, you are going to lose them. Uh, in 1918, chiefly because of the war, people did not tell the truth. The disease was known as Spanish flu. National public health leaders called it ordinary influenza by another name. And this was echoed locally. And this false reassurance quickly became counterproductive. And I'll tell you how extreme it got. In Philadelphia, for example, when they closed schools, churches, theaters, saloons, canceled all public meetings, the paper actually said this was not a public health measure. Well, how stupid did they think people were? In Little Rock, a doctor reports his hospital is closed, doctors and nurses are dead, there are, quote, miles of double rows of cots, everywhere there is only death and destruction. What did the Arkansas Gazette and the Little Rock say? Quote, Spanish flu is playing the grip, same old fever and chills, unquote. People knew it wasn't uh, plain old Le Grip. I believe that society is built on trust. The lies destroyed the trust in the authority, and without trust, society began to disintegrate. It was an incredibly alienating experience. As I think most of you know and would agree with, in most disasters, the best in people routinely come out. In 1918, this was not the case. Uh, to quote one person, it, it kept people apart. You had no school life. You had no church life. You had nothing. It completely destroyed all family and community life. People were afraid to kiss one another. People were afraid to eat with one another. It destroyed those contacts and destroyed the intimacy that existed amongst people. In many localities, both rural and urban, there were reports of people starving to death, not because there was any lack of food, but because not only their neighbors, but even their relatives, even sisters, were afraid to bring them food. It became so bad that Victor Vaughn, who was a sober, serious scientist, not given to overstatement, said, if this continues for a few more weeks, civilization could easily disappear from the face of the earth. Now, you might think that is entirely because of the disease fear, but I think it was closely related to the messaging. And there's one example, an outstanding example, with a different message and a totally different experience, and that was San Francisco, uh, which had a big full-page ad signed by the mayor, the city council, business leaders, trade union leaders, huge type said, wear a mask and save your life. As a matter of fact, masks didn't do any good. But that was a very, they didn't know that. But it, the main thing is, it was a very different message than it's ordinary influenza by another name. And in San Francisco, it functioned. When they closed schools, public, uh, the school teachers volunteered for everything from ambulance drivers to telephone operators. Nobody starved in San Francisco. They were extremely uh, uh, well organized, and I think it was definitely a function of that messaging. Now, back to the NPIs. 
the non-pharmaceutical interventions. They will do some good, but one of the things you don't want to do is oversell them. Uh, again, there's going to be great difficulty in sustaining them. In Mexico City in 2009, at the height of the fear, the government recommended wearing masks on public transit. And they were distributed for free. And four days after the recommendation, usage peaked at 65%. And four days later, it was down to 27%. To do any good, it's got to be sustained. So you need to get out front. You need to stay out front. You have to be credible. You have to be ahead of the internet. Again, don't oversell them. Probably the most positive statement you can make is, this will get better in four weeks and it'll be gone in eight weeks. It's about the length of time it takes a disease to move through a particular community. So what can be accomplished with NPIs? You can take a little bit off the top, which means you save some lives. You can also lessen the stress on healthcare by stretching it out. And there are two classes of NPIs. One is social distancing and the other involves personal acts. One thing, quarantine is totally ineffective and a large scale. That is not an NPI you ever want. And if any political leader suggests it, you need to push back hard. There is outstanding evidence, 1918, quarantine is useless. For this, too, there are other diseases quarantine works for, not for influenza. Uh, one of the most obvious social distancing measures is things like telecommuting. Uh, then you start getting into dicier ones, depending on the severity of the pandemic. Uh, CDC has developed a uh, standard somewhat akin to the uh, Safer Simpson Hurricanes scale of what they'll recommend, depending upon how severe, whether it's a Category 1, Category 5, et cetera. As school closing, it's not so easy to pull off, because again, when you close a school, it's got to cl stay closed for weeks. What happens to the parents? Where do the kids go? If they're going to play together, it becomes kind of, it doesn't do any good. But that's one that, under certain circumstances, would be recommended. Then you get into even, even more stringent uh, limits, ranging from you know, up to closing churches, canceling sporting events. In 1919, they didn't play the Stanley Cup. Uh, these are things that will be guided by CDC. I would urge you to pay attention to their recommendations. But again, you are going to be on your own. The other issues are individual behavior. What you can do as a, yourself or advise your family, and of course, in terms of communication, tell the public uh, what they can do to protect themselves. The first, which will work, but it's almost impossible to pull off, is sequestration. If you can somehow remove yourself from society for a period of weeks, that will protect you. But again, it's almost impossible to pull off because it has to be absolute. The second thing is masks. Masks to protect yourself from getting sick out in public are useless. That is a waste of time and effort. However, if you put a mask on someone who is sick, that will protect people who are around them because it will contain droplets. Now, is a parent going to put a mask on a sick child? Well, they might if it knows it will protect the rest of the family. Uh, masks in the home when somebody is sick, for the healthy people, that it's a limited usage that might also be effective. But wide-scale public use of masks is not effective. Uh, there are other things that are good for any infectious disease, such as hand washing. Now, the fact is hand, most uh, transition, uh, transmission of influenza occurs through aerosols. So hand washing is not going to affect that. However, some is hand to mouth or hand to eyes. Uh, the second. Uh, thing is cough etiquette. <clears throat> that is not cough etiquette. You walk along, you open a door, 
Somebody else comes by, opens the same door, rubs their eyes, they have just infected themselves. So coughing into your hand is not a cough etiquette. Coughing into your elbow, that's cough etiquette. Uh, now it's fairly standard behavior. If your kid is sick, you keep them home. It is not standard behavior if you're sick to stay home. So adults have to stop trying to be heroes. If they are sick and they think they have influenza, they need to stay home for two reasons. Number one, it protects other people. Number two, it also protects them. You know, the most serious complication, but by no means the only one, of influenza is bacterial pneumonia. Your immune system is very weakened by, the, and particularly in the lung. And bacterial pneumonias develop over time. So if in any doubt on influenza, including seasonal influenza, not just the pandemic, stay home. Uh, the final lesson from, is not really from 1918, it's from 2009. And this, to a lot of extent, to a large extent, is above your pay grade. That is that planning does not equal preparation. There was a tremendous amount of planning after bird flu first surfaced about pandemic preparation. And I was involved in a lot of it. And then the 2009 pandemic, which was extremely mild, came along and it knocked everybody off balance. Even so, there were incredibly irrational responses, not only in places like Egypt, that we may consider relatively backward, developing, or China, or India, but there were plenty of irrational responses in places like Britain and France. And Brazil almost behaved to a certain extent in terms of messaging, like 1918, they were, they were telling lies and they had some of the, the highest case mortality in the world in their southern states. And I think there's a linkage there. There was also an Ebola, totally irrational responses that had nothing to do with public health proper practices. So the planning is going to be useless unless it's actually executed. And the decisions to do that is usually going to be made by a political leader whom emergency management experts report to. So the greatest challenge to the public health community and to the emergency management community is to somehow get political leaders to make a rational decision in the middle of a crisis. I don't have the answer to that. And that really depends on your ability to lead and get them to pay attention. Thank you. Any questions? They're very different diseases. In fact, SARS would be a disease where quarantine would, would be effective. Uh, the difference is you can infect someone with influenza before you have any symptoms yourself or certainly very early in the infection. SARS, you cannot, and the, and the same is true for not just for H1N1, for, but for all influenza viruses pretty much. Uh, SARS, you are not infectious until you are really sick. You're already flat on your back. You're not going around in public. Most of the SARS deaths were, were uh, healthcare workers uh, who infected themselves. Uh, so, you know, the H1N1, you know, these things may sound scary. H5N1 is one of the, you know, the first bird flu. H7N9 is a bird flu we're worried about at the moment. Uh, but, but, you know, H1N1 in 1918 was deadly. H1N1 in 2009 was not deadly. The World Health Organization has a pretty decent, it's not great, surveillance system. I say it's not great because there are a lot of countries that do not participate. Uh, you know, most of the world does participate in the surveillance system. Uh, 
And in those countries, they will pick up a new influenza virus very rapidly. But it's still, and probably, you know, quite possibly when it's in its very early stages. Uh, the real problem is the rapidity with which it spreads and the fact that it takes months to make a vaccine. There is, you know, just first you have to scientifically isolate the virus, which can happen pretty quickly. Then you have to start growing it, and we, we, we have pretty ancient uh, technologies for this. One of the things that happened after bird flu surfaced was a lot of money went into faster production technologies for vaccine. But by the time you distribute it around the world and administer it, you know, million, tens and millions of doses, you're still talking about probably a best case of six months. Uh, so there's a, and then the vaccines themselves are not great. The, uh, in the last, since 2003, your seasonal influenza vaccine has ranged from 10% effective to 61% effective. 61% is the highest in roughly the close to the last 20 years. So even when you get a pandemic vaccine, there's no reason to think that it's going to be more effective than the seasonal vaccines, uh, which still leaves a lot of vulnerability. That's why, again, the first thing I said, you need to pour resources into a universal vaccine. Uh, there's enough scientific work on it to strongly suggest it is possible to do that. And if we had had common sense priorities in the last 30, 40 years, we probably have it by now. Well, I think that's a good question. And influenza, I wouldn't particularly worry about contamination. Uh, you know, the virus can, there are other things where it would be a problem, but for influenza, not much. I mean, the virus can survive outside the body. Uh, it can survive on a hard, hard surface, depending on humidity and temperature for, for quite a long time. But there's so much influenza circulating in the community anyway, uh, that would not be a significant concern for this particular kind of emergency. There would be for others. There are some uh, pretty good guidelines that, the, that I would, you know, I, as I said, I participated in, in part of the planning, so obviously I'm going to say what I already said is good. Uh, yeah, but C CDC has uh, some, and I don't want to imply that I dictated it. I was just one of, you know, 100 people who had anything to say about it. Uh, I, I think their guidelines are pretty good, and you can find that on, on their web website. Uh, in terms of the private sector, a lot of companies have put a lot, after bird flu surfaced, put a tremendous amount of energy into trying to figure out how to uh, preserve, you know, their business continuity and the supply chains. Uh, the problem is, uh, you know, the planning is one thing. Planning does not equal preparation. You know, number one, at the very least, it has to be tabletop games. And those things have to be taken seriously. And beyond that, the people at the top have to be invested in it. As I said, I think the biggest challenge to an emergency manager in something like influenza is to get the person who makes a decision to do so rationally rather than to whatever they see as their political advantage or out of their instinctive that may or may not be correct. Well, the, the boss is the virus. You know, earlier I said the seasonal flu ranges from 3,000 to 56,000 deaths in the United States, according to CDC. And that is a function primarily of what the virus wants to do. Uh, and to a lesser extent, how effective that year's vaccine is. As I said, the vaccine, sometimes it's a good match, which is 50, 60 percent. That's a good match. Sometimes it's not such a good match. Now, a few years ago, it was 10 percent. Not a very good match. 
uh, this year in Australia, which has already gone through its flu season, it was 10%. Whether it's only going to be that effective here in the United States, we don't have enough data to evaluate at this point. So, but they haven't made any mistakes. I don't have any criticism. It's, it's just nature is the boss. You know, you can't stop a hurricane uh, other than get out of the way and hope that you're planned and resilient and so forth. Uh, and you, the virus, you don't have any control over the virus.